horsepower. One horsepower is a lot of fun. A hundred horsepower will drive you round a tour of France. We're going to be stopping off at the Versailles, the Chantilly, Equine establishments, making our way towards Bordeaux, past a couple of stag hunts, a canter along the beach not far from Dume de Pilat, a little village in the foothills of the Pyrenees we're heading off to, Mirepoix. But we're only using that as a vintage sports car staging post while we investigate the Pau area. Bernays sauce from cooking. Between Wellington's victory at Waterloo and the Second World War, the British used to love the Pau area so much so that they set up their own golf course, racetrack and hunt. Hunting on horseback like the kings of Versailles. The stables of Versailles are really worth seeing and... Chantilly makes quite a spectacle for a horse race on the flat. Power, proper steeplechase course like Cheltenham and the Cotswolds. That's in England, where we've set off from. There's the three main disciplines there. Just the same, it's dressage, which I always find a little bit cruel to put a horse through that level of control, but I understand it's not. I think you just have to choose that prima donna horse. Those ADHD horses, they might be good for racing on the flat, but cross-country or point-to-point or steeplechase, you wouldn't want that tendency quite so much. Not in its raw form. Not fox hunting so much in France, though. Stag hunting. Which do get in Devon and Scotland. We'll be popping in on Carcassonne, and then heading across the languedoc Roussillon coast, across the Bouche de Rhone, to Paca, a Provence and Alps. Coat to to a real festival of horsepower. Thousand horsepower to every Formula One car. A hundred horsepower to your average passenger car. One horsepower to every horse. Oh, um, heavy dray shire pony that pulls a wagon full of beer. It's got to be more than one horsepower compared to the pit pony that the granddad took charge of. Great granddad. But there's an ever-increasing amount of horsepower in the world. Um, an ever-decreasing number of horses. We just don't need them anymore after the First World War. And if stags and foxes aren't a farmed resource, we won't need them anymore, so there won't be any. There's the pre-First World War thing of hunting things out of existence, like the wolf that's now been a reintroduced species and only government-approved colours kill, like those idiot big game hunters that just come and shoot and stalk. Why not create ritual, pomp and circumstance and try and keep it as humane as possible? Ceremony gives respect to the animal. And the bloodlust of the hunt needs feeding through the farmed resource supply of foxes and stags. In France, this is the Grande Chasse. The venery is a rather involved term. La chasse de course. How would he do if Lewis Hamilton had to do three disciplines? <sighs> Throw in a bit of off-roading for him, and perhaps it has to be in the same vehicle. I've never really quite understood how horse riding is a female-dominated sport. I think it's partly given the assurance of control that you can control that big beast between your legs. Don't worry about men. They're hopeless. But men are hopeless. They don't like to get involved with horse riding. I've had it quoted to me. I don't like to ride anything that's bigger than me in the certain departments, if you see what I mean. So many men are scared of horses. So Monaco, of course, for the Grand Prix. And that's the Grand Prix, Formula One Grand Prix. Grand Prix's also come from horse racing. Along the coast to Cannes, which still has a sandy beach. And then on to Nice, which is like stony, like Brighton. We'll then have to head north, homeward bound. Lyon, pop in, see what Merribel in the Three Valleys is like in summertime. I've chosen Chalons and Champagne and Troyes as convenient stops on the way back to Calais. So at one horsepower, cross-country, show jumping and dressage. What would be the thousand horsepower equivalents? This is a bit more like a fantasy football league than any sort of reality that's ever going to happen. And who would be the best driver? No, this is... So academic, because Formula One is more like 
point to point or horse racing on a track like we bet on. Formula One is like racing consortiums. So let's stretch it a little bit. Which driver of all time would be best if it was a combo of the race, not a steeple chase race because there are no sleeping policemen speed bumps in Formula One. I'd be careful. Formula One race is like an enhanced thousand horsepower of a one horsepower racing on the flat. Rallying a little bit like cross country. Both of those appeal to me the most, but what would be the motorsport equivalent of dressage? I can't say evil can evil because no one knows what that is. I'm tempted to say like BMX or skateboarding, but no, it's not motors. It's not even one horsepower. What is a human power compared to a horsepower? I've got to look that up. Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen do give good donuts. That's not freebies when you do the pit walk. It's burning rubber on the track. God, that gets up your nostrils. Kimi Raikkonen, without doubt, the best driver of all time. He could even do movie stunts. He could be the stuntman in the car. He could do it better than them, but he doesn't need to, does he? Dressage? That's got to be the same as movie car stunts. Oh, I do hope that Auto Translate works well for this, because this is going to be another one video and the whole channel gets demoted. That was movie car stunts. Movie car stunts. Which in anywhere else other than America that speaks English would be film car stunts. I'm disappearing off down a rabbit hole here. The Duke of Wellington brown nose that claims to be the promoter of the last stronghold of Britain in France. In the Bernays region in France. Establishing the first golf course on the continent. And fox hunting and horse racing. A grand tour era and... 1930s perhaps, 1920s, 1930s, era expat community since Wellington times. It's still muddy, it's still Wellington times I suppose, but the club has had three increasingly less salubrious clubhouses, though the first two were truly representative of the sport of kings. Nowadays everyone in the club is French, they wouldn't necessarily identify as Anglophiles, which isn't remotely influenced by Jimmy Savile. Le Suc d'Anglais is currently in a rather run-down manor house, I suppose you'd say. In as Irishly damp corner of a foreign feed old as you'll find. Rightly, as many would say, because the Irish produce some of the best affordable hunt horses. And race horses. For a couple of hundred years they were a big part of the scene. I am only focusing on Le Grand Chasse. There is the Petite Chasse where you're chasing rabbits and little things like foxes that aren't really worthy of horseback riding. I think it's a licence, it might be a club membership, I'm not too sure. About £300 a year compared to £3,000 a year for hunting stags on horseback. And still, the clubhouse is a bit run down, but in Cotswolds anyway, it's all centred around pubs these days. Stately homes used to host a hunt just as a matter of pride and identity, but it tends to be mainly pubs since the saboteurs. Hefty fines in France for hunt saboteurs. Less so if you go after real prey rather than stick to the drag. There are still some purists that go in with what I'll describe as a oyster knife, but a much large, an oyster knife turned into a spear. Imagine that. That's what you go into the exhausted stag with, the head of the hunt, and straight into the heart to put out its agony. Then you cut off bits, give it to the dogs, they have their time, cut off the hooves, give it to the ladies and the children. Gosh, the pride of receiving a chopped off deer's stag's hoof. But just as the petite chasse on foot, it's all done on a budget. Even the presentation is, they don't even plait the manes of the horses. They don't put the, not nail varnish, they don't put the vegetable oil on the hooves to make it all shiny. The turnout isn't the equipage of the Cotswold and North Cotswold hunts, which is all I can comment on. Have I been on one? I'm good on jumping three foot six fences, which would be fairly low on a show jumping standard, but perfectly adequate to join a hunt. Yes, I would need an experienced horse. The blind 
hedge is quite a different thing to red and white poles, I confess. But it's the money, the annual membership. So I used to work at sort of 17, 18 in a country pub, serve good food and good real ale. Um, see an additional blog. And the um, horse riding set that used to come all the way out two hours from London. They used to have beautiful such cottages in various villages. Or just get away from their city trader husband on a Sunday morning. My architectural prospect, University of the Time, lifted me above the status of the stable girls, which wasn't insignificant. Quite a class-crossing career. But I was considered more of a potential toy boy than a prospect for the daughters. Or sons. But they liked me. I got to go to a hunt ball. I watched and I think followed is the phrase. A fair few hunts that go from different locations all the time. Yeah, about £3,000 a year for the Grande Chasse. And about 300 for the Petite Chasse. Little things like foxes and rabbits. And wild boar, for that matter, are hunted on foot with dogs. Idiots with guns. There's about 500,000 foxes a year killed. Hunting's highly regulated in France. You get a little bracelet that shows your allowance of what little things you're allowed to kill. And get fined if you kill too much. Even if it's two different people in the same pack, so to speak. There's been scandals about people getting shot on hunts as well. Children. You don't get a bracelet for that. But that Batu, there's no real liturgy to it, the equipage of it. It can't be elaborated into culture. There is an additional aspect to the venery, that this can be translated almost like going on the pull, going on the hunt for a woman. But in tone, it's more like going out on the hunt for where the ladies of the night are hanging out, if it's used in that way. Limoges and Bordeaux, there have been scandals as far back as Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry II of England. The basis of that British claim in Bordeaux, well, there's 30,000 of us. 1150 to 1450. This is back when artists were able to do little more than caricatures and tapestry was the high art. <laughs> We're on a two-week tour of France. This is as the end goal and the game of catching up with Lewis Hamilton. Yes, pilgrimage is a grandiose phrase. It is a slow process, just the same traveling around France for two weeks. But it could be described as celebrity stalking, really, I suppose. Or perhaps we could align ourselves with paparazzi. It's not much different, is it? But... No, you know, it's a proper sports car. If you can get into it, you're low slung. You are sat on the floor and it's hard sprung suspension. You know about every mile that you're travelling. I'm not saying the road's bad in France at all. Certainly the payage, that's their business. We did want to take the B roads, the back roads. And broadly speaking, though there were exceptions, I was pretty much limited to about four hours of travel at a time. Now, at 90 miles an hour, that's a fair distance. Straight off the ferry, you're fresh and enthusiastic. And you think, you, I know, looking at the Pentagon, I'd love to say, hang a left into the Loire. But that's where you're already, you'd be off to Belgique and Germany. In one go, through the night, you get most of the way to Bordeaux. And you're there for breakfast. Petit déjeuner. I don't want to harp on about the Britishness of Paul, because it's all those exaggerated after-dinner stories written almost a century later. I'm sure there were French cavalry hanging out in Tarbes, didn't really want to accept Waterloo, but the variations on the story of the British and French cavalry meeting up for a battle, but then decided to indulge in the sport of kings and go off on a stag hunt instead. You can find on Wikipedia, and it's nice to think of it as some sort of surrender-like meeting, but it's as fake as that First World War thing of the British and the Germans playing football in no-man's land, just impossible because of the craters. 
There wasn't a flat bit of land anywhere to kick a ball. But by 1915, not 1815, that century, the anglicising was pretty much over with by the shouting. But back to Bordeaux, which has been a French capital during the First World War and the Second World War, when they've had to move out of Paris temporarily. Oh, 2012, a more recent scandal, um, a maths teacher, I shouldn't laugh, and a 15-year-old girl from Britain um, escaped on the day that he was supposed to be sacked and was found in Bordeaux. The French police couldn't help. There was no crime being done. Perfectly legal if they're at it like rabbits in France. If the parents didn't want to press for a kidnapping charge. But Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, she married a French, one of the Louis, one of the French Louis. Um, she got the Pope to send him off to Jerusalem and she followed. But her knight in shining armour died. She was married for 14 years and had daughters. Then a month or two later she married the English king of 18 years old, who she had sons with. 30 and 18. Yeah, that's... For your judgement, does it make a difference if it's male on female or female on male? Henry was King Stephen of England's son. Have you ever heard of King Stephen? I haven't. But you will have heard of one of her sons, Richard the Lionheart. But it was the Bordeaux-Limoges area that she had most success in trying to put her son on the throne by deposing her husband, regicide, because they're ordained by God, rather than just homicide. Nonsense. But there's always going to be scandals around wine. Ten Chinese chateau owners have been investigated, prosecuted by French police for tax evasion and fraud and tampering. But the problem of Spanish wine getting into French wine bottles is much more widespread. Um, a bit like wool. There's the problem that wine costs more to produce than you can sell it for. Even more and more French people are drinking beer. I know, I can't, I can't understand it either. Like all farmers in France, you might think that landowners or the vineyard owners are much more like gentlemen, aren't they? There's a militant wing. French wine is being adulterated for profit. Ooh la la! Voila, there were cavemen 20,000 years ago, and Celts, then Romans, in Borde de la Haut, along the water. Tin giving way to sugar and slaves. But the 1700s were Bordeaux's golden age. Architect Victor Louis brought the Enlightenment era. The Girondins were the wrong side of the French Revolution. The Montagnards generally having the upper hand. But after the Duke of Wellington had inspired Abba, Louis's nephew, the Duke of Bordeaux, was trying to become king. Roi, oh, beg your pardon. Since 2007, Bordeaux has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site. France, so easy to fall in love with. Every scrumptious little cute morsel of it. Even the Remblochon, that is Paris. But if you decide to live there, it can be a demanding high-maintenance relationship. The gossip can be hard work. The municipal that formed the control of the interactions of who were brought up through school to be good citizens and déjeuner. Now Bordeaux is a pilgrimage in itself for many of us, worth its weight in claret. This is perhaps one of the first instances that you get the sense of expatriates. Certainly if you're in the wine and hospitality business, this would be a bit of a mecca for you in training terms, same as you might think central London restaurants might be. And cultivating your French language skills would help you with your wealthy Russian private clients. You may be looking to go into that yacht charter business or just work your way up and through sommelier. Isn't.
that elitist accompaniment to elitist food. There are many small parcels of vineyard come up for sale, and there's many an expat that's wanted the lifestyle choice of a vineyard. The social cachet of it all. You can meet the sons and daughters of these people that are the face of a business in Bordeaux. Now Bordeaux is on a river estuary, a bit like the Mersey, I'm going to say. A bit like Liverpool is on the Mersey. It's not really by the seaside as such. But there is, not a million miles away, Dune de Pila. Um, there's also uh, La Rochelle and the Ile de Ré, where apparently half of Paris disappears off to every summer. We're on the west coast of France. The Gironde River on a map almost seems like it's been windswept away from perpendicular to the Atlantic winds. Dune de Pila is like a huge expanse, like a city, but just of sand, with a few campsites and trees behind it. There's an enthusiastic fraternity of kite surfers, but really, it's so windy so much of the time. The majority of Dune de Pila and the extended zone is good for nothing. Paragliders, I pass over that coastal soaring. There are slightly hippie aspects of Bordeaux, the city. It's got a feel to it, a little bit like Bristol perhaps, but without the edge. Privilege and money, yes, but working. Not the idleness and vacant of the Ile de Ré, the La Rochelle appendage. There's good reason why there's so many British in Bordeaux. And really, the Loire as well, um, and the Dordogne further south. Real British enclaves within the Pentagon. And traditionally Brittany, I understand, to the north. I don't know anything about it, it's Cornwall as far as I'm concerned. For centuries, Bordeaux and the Loire were le hours in the days of knights in shining armour. The industry and currency were largely established by us, the British. Claret and brandy for centuries, having more use as a legal tender than gold coins or any sort of early promissory note. Coins could be clipped. Yes, there was a lot of cooperation towards the Holy Land during the Crusades, but the British and the French squabbled kingdom by kingdom for centuries over the Loire and Bordeaux region, and far inland, and then beaten back until just the island of Bordeaux was all that lasted on the mainland of France until all the, those base estates that gave rise to all those dramatic forts and castles, chateaux, turrets, moats, local marriages and allegiances changed. Centuries of slow change until we were beaten back with battles, but still a sphere of influence. Historically, there were two ways you could avoid the Barbary pilots and the Spanish main, the fortified hilltop city of Carcassonne, guarded one along the base of the Pyrenees. Just like Genoa, school children in Britain relish reading how the Mongol Empire helped extend their territory by flinging plague victims' dead bodies on catapults into the walls of the city. I often have to point out that there were three main plagues, bubonic plagues, one about 500 AD, another one in medieval times. There's one mainly in China and India in um, 1880. I suppose we should add Covid. Or something. More sophisticated means of transmission than catapults over walls. Probably because they know those cute little designs send them on out automatically. Bordeaux wine villages, don't miss them. So you get a different flavour to the Rhone or the Bourgogne, Burgundy wine regions. Do three. In Burgundy, of course, Dijon. And if you're in the southern Rhone, um, you could do work, much worse than Aix-en-Provence, but you might want to go for Avignon. Try and fit in UNESCO point 
point to guard, but really that's a more relaxing thing and you have to do give it a day. You might not have a day. But that's still a long drive off yet. The whole of the south west coast of the Gulf on the bottom edge of the Pentagon of France. It's mussels and oyster beds. It's a long, low, muddy tidal region. Perfect for the shellfish. I know, it's a bit more Miles and miles and miles of coastal drive. All factory farmed terraces of posts in the mud. Sete, which is the nudist beach sort of area. Commoditized by swingers. Drive on by and leave the of what's given freely. Art will eat itself. Available opportunity. But it's our silly questions that go against its core. Timber framed town with wooden beamed. Arcades in the town square on the ground floor that protect people from the elements in days gone by from the rain was where we stayed before this long coastal blast. Sweetest town, lovely restaurants and a nice hippie vibe to some of the street musicians. It feels homely in so much that it's void of the mercenary, touristy aspect that uh, Carcassonne has. You will eventually reach uh, Bouche de Rhone, the mouth of the River Rhone, where since Greek times the traders, the galleons, have gone up the River Rhone a little bit, taken a muddy slipway across to the Le River Loire, which then takes you to the Atlantic and the uh, Cornish tin mines, would have been of value then. The slipway where big boats were towed by horses and mules is now a bit of a sort of industrial corridor and the same parts of the Rhone and the Loire aren't quite so navigable but what, by what we see as reasonable means of transport you don't want to go down a river for days on end in a coracle do you? Carrying it over weirs and rapids the equivalent of a man with a van in those bygone days where what you could carry was a major investment and your profit was largely determined whether you would risk carrying it near or far to increase your investment. Recoup. Lyon. You do, I know you do, go on holiday for a week or two and you don't want to leave. But if you're honest, there's more than that. You consider whether you could live there or not. You give it headspace probably if you weren't working, if you were retired. What you see is the height of the season, though. Everything closes when the schools go back. There is a long school holiday. There are a lot of public holidays, but it's almost as short and brief a season as Greece. But that really just means that you've got all that to yourselves. Sure, it doesn't have quite the same buzz when it's just Northern Europeans. You might even see business opportunities which might de be deceptive. The French are quite particular in their ways. You might do a fantasy property hunt and realise there's a bargain to be had, but there might be some practical hurdles in that process. But that's not the half of it. You've got to learn another language fluently. In your Anglo-Saxon world, you make friends partly by being flash. Buying friends in France is very transparent. It doesn't really come off. There has to be some really quite significant push factors back home, as well as just a pull factor of that bargain. A bit like the analogy of the vintage VX220 sports car, getting you into that club, if only at entry level. You will find that you become part of really quite an elitist expat community but the frequency of those interactions might be little more than seasonal, perhaps not satisfying enough. 
if you're looking to be integrated into an expat community, you really probably want to be looking at the Spanish classes. In France, your children will be accepted as locals much more than in Italy, where it would take generations, and where old money isn't really so clean of conscience. There's no getting away from it. There's a certain je ne sais quoi, almost class to France that the juntas, the dictatorships of Spain and Italy, just don't bring. But there is often little patience for that class. Beyond the messiche of Paris. In large part because so much of France is that rural conservative with a small c. Met in front of the rain shadow, a number of sunlight hours per year, really, to most of us, that's the most important thing. Your foothills of the Pyrenees, almost Spain offers a high number of sunshine hours per year and often high rainfall straight off the Atlantic. I went for where that rain falls as snow in the eastern Alps, south of Geneva, Savoy. Not traditionally France, traditionally Italy. Can you see France in a two-week vacation? Is one of the questions we're trying to ask ourselves here. It's many Americans think they can see the whole of Europe in a two-week vacation. They can't get a flavour of, get to know, two very different things. If you're excluding Paris and the Ile de France, which is all that France is, in a way, yes, you can get round the country and start to feel like you're getting to know it. It's varied history and landscape, climate, people and customs give it a very different air in very different areas. All over, not so long ago, were city-states. We're off to Monaco, uh, one of those last city-states, theoretically outside of France. It's on the bulbous protrusion of Provence that has its own special microclimate, slightly extended away from the Alps. Not in a rain shadow, it has more than its fair share of sunshine hours per year. Or is that just sales patter to accentuate its tax haven status? What is the enclave of Monaco and Monte Carlo like? And perhaps, to some more importantly, what is the Monaco Formula One like to experience?